Hi everyone and welcome to the Movement Image. In this video we'll discuss Bellatar's The Turin Horse, a dense post-apocalyptic masterpiece with strong philosophical undertones that's also, by many accounts, a little tedious. That said, we have to ask ourselves, is this just the deal when it comes to arthouse cinema, or is it Bellatar's intention? Only one way to find out, so let's dive in. The film opens with a narrator retelling the apocryphal story of Nietzsche's mental collapse on the streets of Turin. It was there that he saw a cabman brutally beating a horse. Affected by the scene's cruelty, Nietzsche ran over and threw his arms around the horse, weeping maniacally as he begged its owner to stop. Inconsolable, Nietzsche was taken to rest in isolation. Following a period spent in complete silence, Nietzsche uttered his famous last words, Mother, I am dumb, and never spoke again, retiring to the care of his family who watched over him until his death 11 years later. Tar's film intimates the other side of this story the fate of the horse and its vicious owner. The philosopher is never mentioned again, but the resulting film has deep roots in Nietzsche's work, especially his concept of eternal return. Since the film's debut in 2011, not much has been said about the connection between the film's plot and Nietzsche's work, which leaves a significant thematic aspect of the film unexplored. This video aims to remedy that. First, I'll explain Nietzsche's concept of eternal return. After that, I'll cover the film's plot and how it relates to eternal return. The idea of eternal return came to Nietzsche on the shores of Sils Maria, Switzerland, an area that doesn't lack in panoramic beauty. More than the common reference points for Nietzsche's philosophy like the will to power or death of God, it's eternal return which runs through his work most deeply. Nietzsche referred to eternal return as his thought of thoughts, and genuinely considered it to be the wellspring from which his other thoughts flowed. He was weary of the fatalism of Christianity, and saw eternal return as an opportunity to return agency to our lives. For Nietzsche, it wasn't God's plan, but our plan for ourselves that mattered. Through eternal return, people could overcome the complacency of waiting for the afterlife and usher meaning into every choice, letting them take their lives and their decisions back into their own hands. The following passage from Nietzsche's 1882 book, The Gay Science, marks his first thorough documentation of eternal return. The Greatest Wait what if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness, and say to you, This life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more, and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence, even this spider and this moonlight between the trees, and even this moment and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or how well disposed would you have to become, to yourself and to life, to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal? In addition to some serious hyperbole, what Nietzsche lays out in this passage is a thought experiment that he believes will spur us to make more satisfactory choices in life. The quote's a little heavy though, so let's unpack it. The loneliest loneliness referenced here is what we're confronted by in deep reflection when the distance between us and our desires can be at its greatest. If you've ever been alone and really down on yourself, and let's be honest, who hasn't, you've got an idea of what this feels like. As the passage indicates, we can confront these moments in two ways. One, as a curse that tells us we are exactly as we fear we are, or the other as an affirmation of the decisions we've made and the person we'll continually strive to be. As such, eternal return feeds on the satisfaction we have with the choices we've made in life. Nietzsche wants us to avoid the fatalism of Christianity and to instead take those things we feel we're lacking and chase them with wild abandon. This is why eternal return is so important as a thought experiment. It forces us to take account of what we strive for and not to procrastinate on getting it. It creates agency in the moment, not to be subservient to a religious morality, but to push ourselves to achieve our wildest dreams. So take something you really want to accomplish, but have never gotten around to. We've all got that thing, whether it's picking up an instrument or learning a new skill. I'll get to it later when the moment's right, you say, but this right moment never arrives, always getting pushed to the back of your mind. If those moments of procrastination were to come back and haunt you forever, would you be okay with them? 
Or would you look at the infinite repetition of that choice as a problem, and instead push yourself to overcome that complacency? This, in essence, is what Nietzsche is asking with Eternal Return. It's also important to clarify what Eternal Return is not. This is not a pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstrap scenario, or some magical solution to all of life's problems. Things like racial and gender biases are very real and have a significant effect on the outcomes people experience in life. Eternal Return doesn't make all of our problems disappear. Nietzsche likes to think that the determination developed by Eternal Return can push us through some difficult situations, but this thought experiment isn't going to magically solve everything. It can, however, help us take action on things within our reach so we don't live with the regret that comes with wondering, what if I'd done more? So to summarize, Eternal Return takes two forms. The more obvious of the two is mundane repetition, that life doesn't change and we instead go through the same acts and face similar outcomes eternally. The other form of Eternal Return is recognition that what eternally returns in life are choices, and it's how we meet these choices which determines our satisfaction with the life we've led. By pushing ourselves to meet this eternal recurrence, we strive to achieve the outcome we'd be satisfied with if it were repeated eternally. To understand how Eternal Return relates to the Turin horse, let's briefly go over the film's plot. The film spends two and a half hours taking viewers through the monotonous lives of the film's characters. The cabman, whose name's Olsdorfer, his unnamed daughter, and their horse. Their lives on the rural outskirts of Turin are bleak. Housed in a single-room hut lit only by candlelight, Olsdorfer and his daughter struggle to maintain their routine in an increasingly isolated and difficult world. On a thematic level, what immediately hits us is this film's repetition. Olsdorfer and his daughter sit in their home, bake potatoes when hungry, and unsuccessfully attempt to take the horse out a few different times. That's really it. The film never blossoms into any grander narrative. Instead, its plot slowly devolves into greater and greater despair. Over seven days, the means of survival for Olsdorfer, his daughter, and their horse are cut off. Where once the horse refused to move, he soon refuses to eat. Soon, the neighbor Bernhard drops by in need of alcohol, and speaks of a nearby town's annihilation from the ongoing storm. Not long after, the well that Olsdorfer, his daughter, and their horse rely on dries up, perhaps due to a curse from a group of visiting gypsies. The characters do little to overcome these hurdles, and instead appear hopeless in the face of adversity, trying the same tired solutions over and over and over again. The film ends when the winds have died and the characters can no longer light flames, resigned to wait in silence as their world is plunged into perpetual darkness. While it might be thematically monotonous, Tar keeps viewers invested in the film through creative use of the tools at his disposal. Though Olsdorfer and his daughter both eat potatoes and stare out the window in each of the seven days depicted in the film, Tar changes perspectives and focal points to keep the repetition engrossing. So, as anticipation of the day's meal begins to build, Tar plays with the elements on the screen. Whereas one day might focus on Olsdorfer's daughter filling the pail and boiling the potatoes, another focuses on Olsdorfer looking out the window as we hear his daughter cooking. Tar also shifts the depth of field to show more or less of what's happening in the house. We may see Olsdorfer sitting on his bed as his daughter moves through the periphery, or the camera may whisk us by one of the characters as the other shifts between menial tasks. In breaking the film down to its bare elements and subtly altering what appears on screen, Tar brings the film's repetitive events to life, making them breathe in and out like an organism. From the outset, these events make it clear that Olsdorfer and his daughter are living in one vein of eternal return, that of monotony and dissatisfaction. Their lives are inconsequential and agonizingly repetitive. It's everything Nietzsche prescribed to those haunted by their loneliest loneliness. There are many examples of this, but the best comes near the film's end, when Olsdorfer gives up on a lamp that will no longer light, stating, We'll try it again tomorrow. This same man who could think of no other way to move his horse than by whipping it relentlessly shows once more that he lacks any sort of ingenuity or originality in his approach. All is eternally the same. For Olsdorfer, to try is to go through the motions. It's not an actual attempt to solve the problem, it's simply trying to fit a square peg in a square hole. If that solution doesn't work, Olsdorfer will try it again until it does. What is it that causes these people to act in such hopeless ways? 
Throughout the film, we're given examples of how humanity has given up and lost its way. Detached Christian symbolism frames the film, like when Olsdorfer's daughter is given a Bible by the visiting gypsies, and she stumbles her way through its words. These examples show how far people have fallen from their belief. The few words Olsdorfer and his daughter speak are empty and base, as though they're being echoed out long after they've lost their meaning. This is the crux of these characters' problems. It's not that the world has crushed their spirits, it's that they never developed the ability to counter the world to begin with. They're so mundane and reliant on conformity that we can't imagine them having a novel solution to a problem they face. Olsdorfer and his daughter have turned away from their wills for such an extended period of time that they completely lack the ability to think. They represent the worst embodiment of eternal return. With them, it is always a reactionary attempt to square their understanding of the world with the events they're facing. Horse won't move? Whip it until it will. Dying of hunger? Keep eating potatoes hoping more food will appear. Lamp won't light? Keep trying until it will. This complacency is addressed in the monologue by Olsdorfer's neighbor, Bernhard. Bernhard comes to Olsdorfer to borrow brandy after he's run out. Upon mentioning the destruction of a nearby town, Bernhard plunges into a monologue that captures the listlessness that brought about the film's events. He says that everything's been degraded, pointing out how meaninglessness and indifference have brought about the world's destruction. The destruction taking place outside is not a cataclysm thrust upon an innocent population, but rather something they brought upon themselves. As Bernhard puts it, it is about man's own judgment over his own self. Bernhard then speaks of how waiting for God's ultimate victory means the mollification of everything that's excellent, great in some way, and noble. Bernhard recognizes that outstanding individuals have lost the ability to achieve the greatness they're capable of. Humanity's desire to stand and wait for something to happen means that there are no great people left. Complacency and systemization have ensured that such approaches have long been forgotten. Instead, people have become insipid and beggarly hopeful that some other force will come along and deliver their salvation. Bernhard's monologue illustrates a divide that puts Olsdorfer and his daughter on one side, and Bernhard and the Gypsies on the other. Where Olsdorfer and his daughter experience nothing but hardships, Bernhard and the Gypsies work to overcome the hardships they encounter. In the scene where Bernhard is introduced, the slow camera pan from behind Olsdorfer's head suggests he's in disbelief that someone could be knocking on the door. If Bernhard experienced trouble getting to Olsdorfer's house, he doesn't speak of it. Instead, he descends into his monologue on how humanity had this coming, takes his booze, and walks out. The gypsies who visit Olsdorfer's well are also free in the desolate environment. We see them make their way on brilliant white ponies, who are obedient, mind you, and it seems as though the wind, which dominates the foreground, hardly even touches them. In stark contrast to Olsdorfer and his daughter, the gypsies are filled with life, as they approach, they are laughing and energetic as they help themselves to water from the well. When Olsdorfer's daughter goes to speak with them, they invite her to join them, saying they're going to America. They have aspirations and an ability to move through this difficult world, again making us wonder why Olsdorfer and his daughter do not. The contrast here further illustrates the difference of eternal return as burden or blessing. While Bernhard and the Gypsies can be viewed as the eternal return of agency and choice, Olsdorfer and his daughter are an example of the habitual and accepting. By going through the motions and lacking conviction to impart meaning into their lives, Olsdorfer and his daughter have lost the will to push themselves through difficult events. Lacking the will to persevere that Bernhard and the Gypsies possess, all things are just meaningless regurgitations for Olsdorfer and his daughter. Through the monotony and repetition of the Turin horse, the audience is forced to confront how they'd act differently in these same circumstances. Boredom is the trigger through which we begin criticizing the film and inject our own will on these characters. The austere setting means viewers are not watching a story play out so much as they're traversing the same waters as Olsdorfer and his daughter. By watching Olsdorfer and his daughter make unsatisfactory choices again and again, we see their life. It is a grim, barely alive existence that no one would wish for. Instead of sitting at the table and bitterly eating a boiled potato in silence, we have ample time to wonder what would happen if Olsdorfer and his daughter acted on their desires. Surely they want to. We're shown their longing for something different many times. Olsdorfer takes his horse out at different points but timidly retreats, 
and his daughter is shown longfully looking out the window more than a few times. These are human people with human desires. They simply lack the capacity to act in a way that will achieve their aims. The magnitude of the problems posed by the Turin horse can't be lost on Tar. This isn't a fate faced only by the characters on the screen. This is a problem that haunts all of humanity. Tar uses the helplessness of the characters in the Turin horse to get us thinking of how they relate to our own lives. Whether it be global warming, the threat of nuclear war, or the magnitude of the systematized world we live in, humans have grown complacent with their own destruction, just as the film's characters have. This is not Tar writing off humanity, but rather his plea that we fight for our lives. The Turin horse is what happens when the Christian god dies and humanity toils under a languishing nihilism. How do we rise to overcome this loss? By putting the viewer through its paces, the film forces viewers to confront their own choices in the ways they are going through the motions like Olsdorfer and his daughter. Similar to Nietzsche confounding readers with the thought of eternal return, Tar uses the Turin horse to provoke criticism of the film's characters. By employing anti-heroics, Tar asks the audience how they could do better than the characters on the screen. And how can we do better? One way is to do as Tar has done, to ask the question. By constructing the Turin horse as he has, Tar has us look at a life that could be lived and see how unsatisfactory we find it. Once we are on that path, we find parallels in our own lives and are forced to ask if we're simply going through the motions ourselves. And are we? In our cynical age, all too often we write things off as pointless or stupid or something to be memed and made fun of. But if this is our knee-jerk reaction to everything, why do we carry on at all? The point of Eternal Return is to pull us back from a void like this and remind us that the dim flicker of belief still resides in us somewhere. Our will remains important, and the agency to enact that will should be a critical focus for all of us. In a world where meaning is drowned by the nihilism of values and other empty platitudes, we must work to find and focus on those things we genuinely care about. This is the importance of Eternal Return and how it can breathe meaning back into our lives.